All right. Hello, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed uh, the last keynote. This was really a fantastic talk by Athena. And so now we are moving on to our next session of short talks. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Megan Peters. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of California, Irvine, just south of Los Angeles. And we have three wonderful short talks for you today. We have Maxwell Schein, Chin, sorry, Schein, um, uh, Patricia Rubish and Nathan Close. And uh, in that order, they are going to tell you about some really fantastic work that they have been doing. And so our first speaker is Max, please take it away. Awesome, thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some work that I did during my PhD with uh, John Murray, Dale Lee, and Hyo Jung Seo. Um, and so it's going to address one question, which is, during perceptual decision making, what happens when the evidence changes? So the problem with studying what happens when evidence changes is that right now, most of the task paradigms, most of the models that we use, most of the ways that we think about perceptual decision making involve some constant stream of evidence that's roughly similar over time. Um, and we haven't, we don't really have the tools, the full set of tools yet to hash out what to do when evidence changes. How do we understand what happens when evidence changes? And what type of strategies do we use to account for these changes in evidence? So one of the limitations here is that we tend to think about perceptual decision making oftentimes in terms of things like the drift diffusion model. Now the drift diffusion model is a model where uh, a model for two alternative force choice tasks where we have two alternatives represented by two bounds, one on the bottom and one on the top. And as we get evidence for one of the two alternatives, we tend to drift in the direction of that alternative. And we make the decision when this uh, integrator type signal crosses the bound, when this decision variable crosses the bound. Um, and one of the limitations of this is that it's only one single strategy that we can look at. It's one single strategy and it really only accommodates a single type of task, which is a task that has evidence, which is, as you can see here, constant over time. So one of the things that I worked on is generalizing this so that it, we even have the possibility of studying tasks with evidence which changes over time. And so we generalize this to the generalized drift diffusion model. And the generalized drift diffusion model is very similar to the normal drift diffusion model, which you can see here, except for it has several extensions that allow us to try and understand different strategies that one might use during perceptual decision making. Um, so for instance, uh, we can do bounds that change over time. We can do evidence that uh, changes. So our drift rate can go up and down in whatever way we want. It can depend on time. It can depend on the position of a particle. Um, and position dependence allows us to do things like leaky integration. Um, we can have changes in starting point. We can do uh, 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 several different generalizations of the standard drift diffusion model, which in the end allows us to test different strategies. But not only does it allow us to test different strategies, but it also allows us to look at different experimental paradigms. So for instance, if we have evidence that goes up and down over time, maybe evidence that kind of spikes like this, maybe some Poisson-like type of task, maybe we have evidence that's constant with a pulse somewhere. Uh, these are all things that we can do very easily with this generalized drift diffusion model framework. Um, and if you're interested in looking in this more, we have a software package called PyDDM that you can look at. You can also look at our eLife paper, which is linked at the bottom of this um, uh, at the bottom of this slide. Um, so now that we have the tools to study different strategies, the tools to understand different task paradigms, we can go ahead and start looking at what happens when evidence actually does change. And to do this, we're going to use this type of a task in monkeys. Uh, so how this task works is, first of all, I want you to look right here um, where I'm pointing. And uh, the goal here is to try and determine whether there are more blue pixels or green pixels in this square patch. If there are more blue pixels, then the monkey is supposed to saccade to this blue target. And if there are more green pixels, they saccade to this target um, in order to respond. However, what makes this task different and what allows us to study evidence which changes over time is that we don't start out by showing the monkey this stimulus all the time. Sometimes we'll show the monkey this stimulus right here, which I'm going to call the pre-sample. The pre-sample is identical to the sample, except that the ratio of blue to green is 50-50. So 
there's no correct answer here. And if the monkey responds during this time, then we give it a timeout punishment. Um, so it's encouraged not to respond during this time, respond during the sample period instead. Um, but importantly, there's going to be a change here from when we go to this pre-sample period where there's no stimulus to this sample period where there is a stimulus. Um, let me show you a quick movie so that you can get an idea for this. So first of all, I'm going to show you an easy trial and then a more difficult trial. Um, and so the easy trial, which is where it changes to a high level of color coherence afterwards. So there's the pre-sample, and then it swaps. And you can see that was an easy trial because there's lots of blue there. But they're not always that easy. Sometimes we have hard ones with a lower coherence. So maybe you could see that one change. I couldn't. Uh, the monkeys can do better than chance. Uh, the monkeys are better than I am at this. Um, but this is kind of the task that we use here. So if we look at the response time distribution of this, um, we see something like this. So let me walk you through this. So the colors here represent different durations of this pre-sample period. So this orange is no pre-sample at all. And this red is 800 millisecond pre-sample. Uh, and then the brightness of these different colors represents whether it was an easy trial or high coherence, um, which is the bright colors, or whether it was a hard trial where it looks more gray. And this is kind of hard to interpret. And what we actually care about is this period, like right here and right here, right when the evidence changes. So let's zoom in right here. But before we zoom in, let's say, what might we expect to see here? So if you think about pretty much every model that's been constructed of decision making, uh, we're going to expect to see something like this, which is we're going along, there are some RTs here. And then suddenly, when this changes, we might expect a ton more responses when we have the easy trials, because once your evidence changes, now the task is easy, you're going to probably respond very quickly. Versus if it changed and you couldn't tell it changed, you're going to respond somewhat similarly. Um, and so this is what we expect to see. And this is a simulation provided by a, um, a generalized distribution model. What we actually see is this. Now, this is strange. Let's, let's walk through this for a second. So this gray, this gray is when there's no change. So this is when it's 50% of each color throughout. And that kind of goes up like this. But when we look at these really strong trials where we would expect a ton more responses, because this, is, this red line is where it changed, right? So this is where it changed to become really, really easy. But we get a reduction in responses for this short period of time. After this, of course, it goes way up, and you have lots of responses after that. But during this short period of time, we have a reduction in the number of RTs on the easiest trials when it changes to something easy. That's really weird. I had no idea what was going on when I saw this. So next step, we looked at behavior, did some neural recordings from this. Uh, we did some recordings from the frontal eye fields. The frontal eye fields are nice for this type of a task because the, it contains sensory information, it contains motor information, and it also contains information about the decision-making process. So sensory information, because each of the cells have a receptive field, uh, it shows a ramping-like activity during evidence integration, and it also is able to generate saccades if you stimulate. So this is maybe a good place to look for this task. And now we can look at frontal eye field activity. And this is exactly what you saw before, except for instead of RTs on the y-axis, we're looking at FEF activity on the y-axis. And let's zoom in again right here. And again, what we might expect from any model that I've ever seen of this is that it's going to keep going, keep going up. And then it's uh, going to keep going up over time. And then once the evidence comes on after some uh, efferent, afferent type delay, there's going to be a huge increase in frontal eye field activity and uh, for the easiest trials and not for the hard trials, sort of like you see here. And this is directly from a simulation. But what we see again is this exact same effect. We have a reduction in frontal eye field activity when we have stronger evidence compared to when we have weaker evidence. And this, is, uh, this does end up being graded too. So the stronger the evidence, the bigger the reduction for this short 100 millisecond to 200 millisecond period. This is very, very confusing. And we're talking what, in the panel discussion earlier about how models can help us make sense of something when we have no idea what's going on. This looks like a perfect time to do some modeling here. Um, and one way to do modeling is to think about evidence integration in three steps. So the first step being evidence comes in, 
And then there's some decision variable that does the integration. Maybe it does fancy stuff. Maybe it's leaky. Maybe it's something like that. Some type of decision variable that does that. And then we have motor output where it actually makes the saccade to respond. And we'll think about this change detection as the monkey having a probability of detecting the change. So on the easy trials, it's very easy to detect the change. And on the hard trials, it maybe detects it with a lower probability. Um, I'm going to show you the high probability ones here just for simplicity. Um, and so if we detect a change, let's suppose that it inhibits the incoming evidence. The intuition for this might be, oh, well, the evidence is volatile. We want to wait until it stabilizes. So then we can have something constant and decision making can be like we like it with no evidence changes. Uh, but when we do this and simulate what we would expect for frontal eye field activity based on the decision variable, we don't get this dip that we got before. We don't get this reduction um, after the stimulus comes on right here. Um, instead, it's just flat, and then it goes up, it goes down. This is uh, very similar to what we would expect from traditional models. Okay, what about this? This is maybe makes the most sense, possibly, from a normative perspective, is if you detect a change, then you take your decision variable and say, ah, I was halfway through this task. I thought I was integrating evidence. I guess I wasn't. Here's the real stimulus. I'm going to reset my decision variable back to zero and pretend like I'm starting from square one. This made a lot of sense to me when I started looking into this. Um, and when you look at it, it does produce this type of a dip, except it only produces it when the frontal eye field uh, cell that you're looking at is within the receptive field. When it's outside the receptive field, it doesn't produce that dip. So we have one, one step left. So we can test this. We haven't shown whether this is true or not. Let's see what this would be different if it were inhibiting motor output. So in this way, if you detect a change probabilistically, you're, uh, instead of touching the decision variables, the decision variable stays exactly as it is. You just briefly pause your motor output. If you briefly pause your motor output, you see this dip, but you not only see it within the receptive field in gray, you also see it in cells outside the receptive field that you can see in red. And this is because there's this rebound effect right here. And when we look at what's actually inside the frontal eye fields, we see this rebound right here. So this is giving us evidence from the frontal eye fields that this motor suppression model is maybe, uh, maybe a pretty good model. We can also look at what happens uh, when we're fitting these models, since these are all generalized drift diffusion models, so we can very easily fit them to data and evaluate their log likelihood. Um, and we have the strongest model coming from the motor suppression model. So this model where we're inhibiting motor output. So it's great for predicting frontal eye field activity. It's also great at behavior. Is there a test that we can maybe give it? Maybe some type of irrelevant motor activity? I know one. How about microsaccades? So in theory, microsaccades should be completely disconnected from the decision variable. The decision variable should not influence microsaccades. And when we look at this, we actually see there is a reduction in activity here too. So motor suppression is occurring even for types of eye movements that are not relevant for the task. So this is giving us pretty good evidence that what's happening here is that during decision-making, when there's a change in evidence, when there's a sudden change of evidence, there's a brief suppression of motor output. And normative, from a normative perspective, you might think of this brief suppression of motor output as, uh, um, as something like uh, you're integrating and your integrator keeps going, but your integrator is slower than this suppression of motor output. And so you want to suppress motor output for a second to give the integrator time to catch up with what you see. Um, and so thank you to uh, the, my two advisors during my PhD, who were uh, John Murray and Dale Lee. Uh, Hye Jung Seo collected this data. Um, and Norman Lamb uh, contributed to the generalized drift diffusion models. So thanks a lot. And I'd be happy to take any questions. I will clap for everybody. Thank you very much for the really engaging and interesting talk. We have one question uh, from Conrad, actually. Uh, so Conrad asks, to which degree should we think of the DDM models as mechanism or how models that are supposed to predict neural activities versus as normative or why models that maybe just predict behavior? Yes, I think that's a, a very good point. Um, I think that we can it, I mean, it depends on how you want to interpret it and what context you want to interpret it. To a certain extent, we know that the DDM cannot possibly be neural activity. Uh, neural activity cannot go below zero. 
Um, you can say, okay, well, maybe there's some nonlinear transform that we can apply, and maybe this nonlinear transform somehow maps onto the neural activity. Um, then you start getting complicated. That's really hard to figure out. Um, I think that there's some room for a middle ground of not necessarily saying this is exactly what's going on in the brain. These are exactly the variables. Um, can be a, this is optimal behavior. This is what we'd expect. However, um, in addition to being descriptive, we can say, OK, well, if this is happening, we might expect to see some type of a signal like this. And so there are, uh, so for instance, there are other things that could cause the rebound. It could be a local circuit property. It could be um, tons of other different things. Um, but if we're saying that this is due to, um, we're saying that this is due to this type of mechanism, um, then we can't have that mechanism, like a reset mechanism, for instance. We can't have a reset mechanism alone explaining this rebound in front of life field activity. So either we can say it goes to something else or it goes here. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we have one more quick question, uh, which is, was there only impact on reaction time or was accuracy also impacted? Um, yes, that's a great, uh, that's a great point. So if we go um, go back to the response time distribution. So actually, um, this is another interesting point, is right after the evidence changes, um, right around this period of time, there's a short increase in error responses. Um, and it's a, it's a transient increase in error responses. It's more than you would expect just from the um, uh, just from the sudden increase. And it's like right around here. And so what this is suggesting is that this motor inhibition, in some sense, failed. Um, and that's a very good point. Uh, we have actually a different paper on this in Journal of Neuroscience uh, 2020. Um, if you're interested more in that error response, we go into that a lot more in that paper. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I have questions too, but I think in the interest of time, we need to stop and move on to our next speaker. So maybe we can move this conversation to the Discord channels. Um, okay, great. So thank you very much. That was a really engaging and interesting talk. And our yeah, thank you.